uh, we're going to have a good time and um, I want us to discuss some profound things in understanding God. Now, there are things about God that he has revealed of himself and there are things about God that he has hidden. Now, it is the king's pleasure to search out hidden things. And God by nature is a hiding God. God does not reveal himself, he hides himself. Because if you are going to find him, it will be because he led you to himself. Or if he is going to reveal himself, it will be because you have fulfilled what he desired of you and the reward will be to make himself known unto you. An example is if you believe, I believe this is in John somewhere, it says, those who love me, are they that keep my word, if you keep my word, I will make myself known unto you. Then he goes on to say, if you love me, you will keep my command and me and my father will come and make our abode with you. Meaning you will see us, you will know us. So there are conditions and principles that the Lord has set in place in order for us not only to have encounters with him, but for us to know him. Your prayer will be as effective as your knowledge of God is. God doesn't just answer you because you opened your mouth to pray. God answers you because you understand the protocols that makes God to answer. So whenever you are approaching God or moving close to God, there are things that you have to, um, you have to be aware of. And there are things that you must pay attention to. Because if you don't, you will be serving a wonderful and mighty God. And you will never get anything out of the relationship. God will produce what he wants, but you will never get your heart's desire. The Bible speaks about God's will for our life. And the Bible also speaks of our heart's desire. Meaning, when we pray, Father, your will be done, it is a good thing, but God also wants to do your will. What is your desire? So it is not just about what God wants, because what God wants is ultimate. But when God can fulfill his work in you, in the manner he desires, then you can have your heart's desires too. Why? Because you will be changed and what you will desire will not interfere with God's divine plan. The reason why God cannot give you your heart's desire presently is not because he cannot. The problem is you can interfere with the divine purposes of God. Are you, are you hearing me? And the key is not to alter or to change God's divine purpose because nobody can. But even if you are attempting to, God will shut down whatever you're doing. The reason why the Tower of Babel was brought down was not because men desired to go to heaven. It's because they wanted to approach heaven on their terms, not on God's term. Our journey on earth is to go to heaven. Is it not? Yes. So why would God get angry, uh, uh, you know, of people building a tower that was going to get to heaven? And God said, no matter what they desire, nothing will be withheld from them. Notice the problem is they did this of their own desire because they did not want to be forgotten. They wanted to make a name for themselves. Yet heaven is to be with God. They wanted to make it about themselves, so God shut them down. Because now they were messing around and they were trying to interfere with the divine plan of God for Jesus to come on earth so that we can be changed, we can be transformed so that we can enter heaven. But now these guys were trying to enter heaven, skipping the purposes of God through Jesus in our life. God shut it down. Is this making sense so far? Amen. So if you are going to get anything from God... 
you need to know the God you're serving. Because if you don't know him, you'll be praying in vain and you will waste in prayer. There is so many people, there's a lot of people that do a lot of praying that God will never answer. That is why when I made the video and I said, too much praying can be a sign of unbelief. And spiritual babies didn't understand what I was saying because they are children. How can they understand anyway? You see, he said, too much praying is bad. The Bible says pray without ceasing. But they don't even know what praying without ceasing looks like. So many people are not praying, they are complaining. A lot of people are venting. <laughs> they are not communicating with God and they are not communing with God. So the key is to understand God and to understand aspects of God because whatever God has revealed is for us and our children's children because it benefits us. As believers, we have uh, compartmentalized God, if that's the right word. We have made God about issues. We approach God when we need something, when we are looking for something, when it's about something. There's just no pure, genuine pursuit of God himself without anything that he can offer. The good news is this, because God's nature is so giving and is so good, even if you're seeking him for just him, you will get what you're looking for and more. Amen. But if you look for him for what you want, then you won't get anything. Now, today I'm going to speak about God's memory. God's memory. Shake your neighbor, say God's memory. God's memory. I, I can't hear you guys. You sound like you're asleep, or is it because I'm calm in my voice? God's memory. What is memory? Can somebody do Maria Webster? Is it Maria Webster? Mary? Mary is Maria. Miriam Webster? Okay, Miriam, okay. <laughs> okay, Miriam Webster's uh, dictionary. What is uh, memory? Memory. Mm -hmm. The faculty by which the mind stores and remembers information. Uh -huh. In order for you to have memories, you need to have the ability to store information. In order for you to have <laughs> memories, you have to have the ability to store information. Now, how does God's memory operate? Because many of us do certain things so that God can remember what we did. Now, indeed, God can look and see what we are doing. But God's memory does not function based on time because God dwells outside of time. So there are certain aspects of God. I don't know if I'm messing you up or if this is making sense. When we approach God, we don't approach him with the understanding of his divine mind and his divine nature. Because we operate with assumptions of how we cognitively operate. We believe that God operates in the same way. But in actuality, God is not bound, nor is he limited by the manner in which we function. If you don't introduce yourself to me and I don't see your face, then I will not remember you. If we don't share time, long time, or if we don't spend enough time together, 
and we go a while without seeing each other. Maybe we were just acquaintances and we pass. I can see you again and say, hey, it's so good to meet you. And you'll be like, no, we've met before. Notice other people store the memory based on the interest they picked when they were having the encounter. And others, their memory will not store anything because it wasn't an important event that compels them to take notes of what just transpired. Now, when it comes to God, God already knows you before you are conscious of yourself. And if God knows you before you are conscious of yourself, then you don't introduce yourself to God. God introduces himself to you. Because you're the one that doesn't know him, but he has known you. When God reveals himself to you or to me, he is calling us to remembrance because we are the one who don't know what happened. But he purposed our being. So in his essence, in his divine essence, he is the one making himself known because you don't know him, but not because he's meeting you for the first time. When the Lord made himself known to Jeremiah, he said, Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. He didn't say, I know you. I knew you. Before I knit you in your mother's womb, I'm the one who put you together. And I set you apart. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So, Jeremiah is discovering his prophethood. But God is telling him, no, 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 no. I already anointed you and I set you apart. Meaning there was a group of people that Jeremiah was chosen among before he even went to his mother's womb. But Jeremiah doesn't remember. Jeremiah doesn't know the event. So to him he's shocked. What is this that God is talking about? I am receiving it, I'm hearing it, but how does he know me? And if he knows my beginning, if he has numbered our days, do you know what it means to number our days? God is not waiting for the day you're going to die. You see how we are counting birthdays, right? I'm 30 this, I'm 31, I'm 50 this, I'm 60 this. Wow. Let me see how far this is going to go. God is actually counting down. You're counting up, he's counting down. In Psalms 106, he says, Precious is the death of his saints to him. Meaning God looks forward for the day that we will transition from this world. And return to him whereby we can actually be able to receive certain things that we cannot receive while being in this body. Now, the first thing that you need to understand is this, is that God is not meeting you for the first time. He knew you. And when he says he knew you, he's not speaking from the perspective of, I saw you when you did not see me. Please understand this. Don't think about this in a human sense. An example is, my son, Andrew, met me when he came out of his mother's womb. But I conceived him before he was in it. I was waiting for him. So when God now, that is the human sense. But when God says, I know you, or I, in fact, he doesn't say I know you. He says, I knew you. God is not talking about simply the time before you entered the body. But God is speaking of events of the future. You already being in heaven with him. God is not speaking from the beginning perspective of your 
memory of him, of your encounter with him. God is already speaking from the other side whereby you have already been sanctified. You have already ascended into heaven and now you are with him. I don't know if somebody is hearing me. God is not looking at you and hoping you make it to heaven. God already knows who is in heaven, not who will be. For you are seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. You are already seated. Many times when we speak of this, we are speaking of it from an authority perspective. No, it's beyond that. The scriptures goes as far as to tell us after, during the tribulation time, how many Jews will actually be born again. It tells you the exact number. Is it, what, what is it? Uh, huh? it? It is a crazy number. It tells you the exact number of the people at that period that will get saved. How does he know that number? Not because he's waiting for them to get to heaven, because they already made it. Yeah, amen. Because anything that is in time has already happened. God is not waiting for it to unfold. It has already happened. We and the angels are seeing it unfold, but to God it already unfolded. That is what prophecy is. And behold, I saw what? A new heaven and a new earth. He saw a vision of what is already established. (laughs) Behold, I saw a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem descending from heaven. How can you see what is beyond time? Because it already is. You cannot see what has not yet existed. Everything you see is because it exists. What has not existed, you can't even think of. Your imagination can't even produce. So God deals with us from a teleo perspective. Not from an amen perspective. So God's memory of us is connected to his divine purpose and how he ordained and predestinated our life. So when the Lord comes to you and says, you are above and not below. (laughs) He's not saying it because you're going through struggles. He's giving you a picture of you already having victory. Before you even know the challenge. Amen. I look at your amen. That is why whenever God speaks to us, he doesn't speak concerning our problems. He speaks concerning our solution. Because you already passed that stage. God is coming to Abraham and saying, Abraham, oof. You will be the father of nations. Everybody say, how can you tell me about being a father of nations? And I don't even have a son. Notice God has skipped the son part. Because God has already unfolded everything else that has to be. Then Jeremiah says, how is this possible? God says, uh, no, uh, Abraham says, how is this possible? God said, go outside. Look at the stars. Can you count them? Look at the sand by the sea. Can you count them? So shall be your descendants. You will not be able to number them. But Abraham didn't even have a son. Meaning if God speaks of what is to come in your life, you have to know that there is already a memory that exists. And that's good. Ah, You missed it. I feel like maybe people online are the ones that are getting it. So the moment God deals with you, you have to understand you're already on the other side of everything you're thinking of. We magnify 
our troubles. We magnify our struggles. We magnify our difficulties. Because we don't understand from what aspect is God looking at us from. The difference between opinion. Opinion is personal. Okay. God doesn't have a perspective. That's right. Are you hearing me? Yes. God only has truth. And you have to understand that the truth, you see, for us, when we deal, we deal with evidence or truth, it is something that has already been established and a crime happens and they try to alter it and that thing that has been will be the evidence to say, no, this is how things should be. So the evidence becomes true because it cannot be altered. It has already been witnessed by many. Right? But if there is a way to disrupt the truth, then the enemy can be winning the you can you can be winning the case and then they come out they say the glove doesn't fit, you lose everything. Because the truth will be altered if the truth depends on man. Most of us operate with facts. But God does not care about facts. God cares about truth. Ooh, that's good. The fact is, you may be broke right now. The truth is, you are multi-billionaire through Christ. Yeah. Now the issue is, do you accept God's truth or will you remain with facts? Because truth is what has been established before time. Truth has nothing to do with time. It is outside of time. So the truth of your life is not centered on your weakness, on you not getting it right, on you missing it, on you falling into the world. On you being left behind when everybody else is succeeding. No, those are predicaments of the flesh. They are not the truth. I, I don't know if you are understanding what I'm trying to say. Because when God looks at you, he's looking at you and God has a problem with you and me. Because we fail to have the memory of God within us. We operate with time. Which is limited. Yet God functions beyond time and everything about us is already predestinated. What does that mean? If I function in condemnation, I am deceived by the enemy because the enemy has convinced me that God is shocked by what I have done. But if God operates outside this realm, outside time, then what I am doing, because he predestinated, meaning he did not only foresee my error, he actually ordained it because all things work for our good. The enemy think you messed up because he is also in time. He cannot see the... Let me push this a little further. The Israelites are about to take over Jericho. They, the spies go in, spy on the land. Look at the land. And <laughs> Rahab the prostitute had to hide them. Took them and stashed them somewhere. And then in the morning, she let them go. Now, you have to remember, in those days, when you were in that business, you had to be at the city gates because that's where the merchants came in and out. So you had to know where the business was. You have to remember, the marketplace in ancient times was literally where people are coming in and out. That's where everything that was popping was popping. 
So in order for her to know where the guards are, how she can hide people, it means that she was informed about the city. Right? Yes. Hello? Yes. So now, she hides the spies and then releases them. Shows them how to escape. When they return <laughs> to their elders, they say, Ooh, the land has this and this and this, and they all speak about this. Some uh, say, nah, the inhabitants, you know, it was no, this, they, they were just going back and forth. Then, when they are about to go and take the city, God says, March around the city, this and that and that. But before they went, God said this When you get in there, preserve Rahab for me, for she is what? Righteous unto me. How can you be righteous while you are a prostitute? She doesn't know the Lord. She has never repented. She is not sorry about what she does. That's what she does. But God says, keep her for me. For she is righteous unto me. Do you know what the problem with the church is? You want to fix people. You don't know that they are strategically placed by God. Everyone would have condemned this woman. But God is saying, don't touch her. She is righteous. By what standard, Lord? By what standard? What is the standard? The standard is, she obeyed me because I placed her there. While she was lost, it was my will for her to be there. So that when my servants come, she, she will hide them. But through her dealing with them, I will also redeem her. And through her, Christ will come from. Do you realize every woman except Mary from the genealogy of Jesus, all of them were messed up. But Jesus had no generational curse. <laughs> if I am predestinated by God, how do I know that I've been predestined by God? Let's look at the scriptures real quick. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, it is a little rough today. But it will be helpful. Uh, let me find this. Oh Lord Jesus. Um, Isaiah 49, verse 15 to 16. Isaiah 49, 15 to 16. Amen. Uh huh. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Stop right there. First of all, a woman cannot forget her child because she had to carry her for nine months. She has to go through first trimester, terrible. <laughs> she, you know, she couldn't eat what she wanted to eat anymore. Everything is just messed up. And then conceives you. And then that child has, they have already been bonding since the child has been in the womb, right? Keep going. Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Mm. He's saying as, as bonded as a mother and a child can be, she could forget. But the Lord said, me, I can't forget. Keep going. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. God has a tattoo of you on his hand. Amen. Engraved you. Keep going. Thy walls are continually before me. Ah, uh -uh, listen to that. Read it again. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. Uh -huh. Thy walls are continually before me. You know, when the Lord Jesus was crucified, right? They did not nail him here. They nailed him here. They nailed him here where the nerves are because they want you to die. But the natural effect 
of being nailed here is your hand goes in what is called a death grip. Because the nerves get damaged, it's like you had a stroke and your hand tightens like this. So when the Lord Jesus was saying, those whom my father has given me, nobody can snatch them. When he went on the cross, the grip was even tightened. Amen. So he's saying, I have engraved you. I have engraved you in my hand. You are engraved. You know one of the interesting things I saw in heaven? Many of you, when you get to heaven, even your name will be corrected. Because many times parents miss the names they should give their children. Many of us will give names that we feel cool about. Or this is such a popular name, or I love this name. But majority of you, when you stand before God, many times God will call you by your father's name because you don't really have the right name. In heaven, they know you by a different name. An example is, Jacob is called Jacob, but in heaven, they call him Israel. <laughs> so he wrestles with the angel, and the angel is wondering, who is this guy? He says, who are you? What is your name? He said, my name is uh, Jacob. He said, no, 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 no. Your name shall be Israel. Notice, how did the angel know this information? Because he's saying, who are you? The guy says, I'm Jacob. He said, oh, you are the Jacob we call Israel. Is this making sense? Yes. But, but understand this by the Spirit of God. So anything that disconnects you from the heart of God, from the mind of God, that puts you in a place where you feel separated from God, Know that it is not God doing that. You are doing that with the help of the devil. That's good. That's good. Even your sin cannot keep God away. Let me prove it to you. Is my hand is not short to deliver, nor my ears dull to hear. But your sins have separated you from me, not me from you. That's what the Bible says. Have separated you from me. Meaning when we sin, we are the ones who say, no, Lord, I don't want you. Because God is much closer to you when you need him than when you don't. But the church teaches you, if you sin, God has left you. Let me show you the irony of it, right? I believe this is... Uh, Psalm 53 or 51, when David is saying, uh, is repenting to God about Bathsheba, right? Mm -hmm. He says, in sin was I conceived. But a lot of people don't really know what he was talking about because you have to understand, Jesse believed his wife cheated on him to conceive David. This is Jewish theology. In the reason why he never considered him, he thought that his wife cheated on him because he doesn't remember laying with her. That is why the scriptures continually tell you that David, the son of Jesse, they are emphasizing it because the means in which David came was strange to Jesse because he doesn't remember having an encounter with his wife. Okay, let me give you another example. How many people know that Noah was a drunk? How many people know that Noah was a drunk? You know that's not true. He wasn't a drunk. He wasn't. <laughs> he was never a drunk. Go to Noah. I'm going to show you something. Go to Genesis. So that you understand how God views us, right? Okay, let us go. After, after the flood, uh, Noah uh, um, planted a vineyard. Can we go there? Who has it? Uh, is Madame Rice here? Yes. Okay, you have it? Uh, yes. Genesis 9 and 20. Uh -huh, Sorry, 20. Uh -huh. And Noah began to be a an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. What does it mean to be a husbandman? He became a farmer, right? He became a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Keep going. And he drank of the wine and was drunken. 
And, and he, he was uncovered. No, no, notice this. He drank of the wine and he was what? Drunken. And he was drunken. And then what happened? And he was uncovered within his tent. Uh -huh. Now, I want you to remember that. He planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and he was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. What does it mean to be uncovered within your tent? Huh? No, it means your wife was exposed. It's not talking about what you think. Keep reading, you'll realize it. And he was uncovered within his tent. Keep going. And Ham, the father of Canaan. Notice. Now, I want you to pay attention to now what the Bible is saying. And Ham, the father of Canaan. Okay, when he mentions all the sons, the sons of, of Noah, Ham is the only one they are emphasizing is the father of Canaan. Mm -hmm. Keep reading. Now look at this. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. Now notice, who uncovered Noah? Ham. He saw the nakedness of what? His father, meaning he saw his mother. Keep reading. And told his two brethren without. He told his two brothers what he had done. Keep going. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. What does it mean? They saw what had happened. Instead of allowing their brother to continue to gossip, they went backwards, meaning they went behind the scenes and covered their father, informed him of what was happening. Look at what happens next. And their faces were backward, and, and they saw not their father's nakedness. They didn't do what their brother did. Keep going. And Noah awoke from his wine. And Noah awoke from his wine. And knew what his younger son had done unto him. How did he know what his younger son had done to him? What did his younger son do to him? He slept with his wife. So when he wakes up, what does he do? He curses who? Canaan. <laughs> read it continue reading look at this and he said cursed be Canaan a servant of servants shall he be notice how do you wake up out of your wine and you know what your son had done to you you attack his grandson immediately you attack his son immediately so the whole time Noah thought Canaan was his son So the whole time he was thinking this is his child, but it wasn't. His son had uncovered him, and he knew what his son had done to him. Not that his son saw him naked. Every time you see, you hear the Bible talking about, and somebody was uncovered, or somebody's nakedness is talking about sexual intercourse. This is a fact. Go look at it. This is why you find that the spirits of the Nephilim, is still manifesting in the land of Canaan, even after the flood happened. The giants are back. How did they come back? Through Canaan. That is why the Canaanites were the way they were. That's why God wanted them annihilated. They were an abomination. <laughs> it's a deep mystery. But everyone who reads it thinks that uh, uh, Noah was a drunk. No, it's telling you, remember, Noah was on the boat. A big old flood just happened. For the first time now, they have seen rain because before that, there is no record of rain on the earth. So all of a sudden now, there's dry ground. He got caught up. He became a husband. Man. He got caught up with his vineyard that he was no longer paying attention to what was going on at home. So when his younger son did what he did, he did not know. So and now his sons came and told him, Dad, this is what is happening at home. That Canaan guy is not your child. So when he came out of <laughs> what he was caught up with, he knew what his younger son had done to him, and he cursed Canaan. Amen. Now, notice, for us, we have to be informed of what happened when we can't see it. But God doesn't need to be informed about anything. That's good. I know I took you in a little rabbit hole, but just to show you this. So God doesn't need to see anything of you or for, of me for him to begin to defend us now. 
God has already secured us before we were conscious of ourselves. Think about it. Before you loved God, why didn't you die? And now that you're in crisis when you're pleading the blood every day. When you are in the world, you are, when you are the most vulnerable, you slept how you wanted, no witch choked you. <laughs> you had no nightmare. Now you are in Christ, now you want to be defensive. Yet God has been watching over you since you are in the world. Now that you have come to him, you should be even be at more rest. But you are not at rest. Now is when now... You are thinking of all the witches and all the wizards and all the weird stuff that happened at night. Wait, what happened when you used to be there? Don't you know that the devil knew that you were already called? Let me, let me explain this to you. The devil always knows who God has chosen because he can see God's hand on you. That is why even when you are among people, trouble follows you and you have done nobody no wrong because the devil already knows who you are. You just don't know who you are. But why couldn't he get you when you didn't know who you are? And now that you know who you are, why are you feeling like you're more vulnerable? The Bible says God gives sleep to who? His beloved. You, you are having nightmares. And the Bible says there will be no sleep for the wicked. <laughs> but you are not wicked. <laughs> why do you have no sleep? You have not rested. You are still not confident in the truth that you have been predestinated. God already locked you down and locked everything about you down. Our prayer simply opens our eyes to what God has already done. Because remember, there is the perfect will of God. There is the permissive will of God. And then there is the will of man which leads to destruction. The perfect will of God is that you know everything that he has ordained for you. The permissive will of God is when you don't know everything, but you catch some things. God is like, okay, it doesn't interfere with my divine plan. You may suffer because you don't know, but it's cool. You are still where I have you. Then there is your way that leads to destruction. Make sense so far? So comprehend this now. Comprehend this. God's image of you and of me is centered on already the end and not the end of your battle with your enemy. You have to remember you are more than a conqueror. Do you know what it means to be more than a conqueror? It means you conquered everything. Now you are more than that, meaning you are no longer fighting because you fought all the battles. That's what it means to be more than a conqueror, not more than a king, not more. A victor is when you have fought one battle and you won. Yay. A conqueror is somebody that has subdued his enemies and his enemies are now serving him. That's what a conqueror is. He's like a colonizer. He's now running the show. But the Bible is not just saying you have conquered. It's saying you are more than a conqueror, meaning that you conquered everything. Now you just sit. So that is the picture that God sees you and me. That is the lens in which God sees us because God is already with us on the other side. Now when we pray, there is a problem if we are trying to remind God how long we have suffered. Because in the realms of faith, you're saying he doesn't know what you're going through. I say this and I say it with all love and humility. Too much praying can be unbelief. Intercession is not persistence in praying for the exact same thing. Intercession is attacking the same situation differently. Because an intercessor is a representative of somebody. 
And an intercessor is somebody that is standing between the, 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 uh, uh, the accused and, and the judge. So there is something that is in motion. So it is not stagnant. Is this making sense? So I don't need to tell God, God, remember, I'm still in the hospital. <laughs> the next day, Father, remember, I'm still in the hospital. The next day, Father, have you forgotten I'm in the hospital? Notice, because I don't see the progression of what I'm praying, what it will do is it will put me in doubt and unbelief. Because faith must be encouraged because your faith can fail. Jesus prayed for Peter and what did he say? I pray that your faith will not fail. But he did not pray for Judas' faith. Even though Peter failed in denying Jesus but his faith was still intact. He could come back. Make sense so far? Are you sure you can hear me? That your faith will not what? Fail. Many of you don't believe that you have faith is because you have attacked prayer the wrong way. And you never got what you want. And now you have reached the place you just say, whatever you want, Lord. That's defeat. (laughs) Jesus looked at his disciples. He said, let me give you two reasons why God wants you to receive what you want. Number one, he promises that he will give you your heart's desire, right? Meaning God wants you to be fulfilled in the realm of your desires. Number two, listen to what he says. He looked at his disciples and said, until now, you have not asked me of anything. Ask that your joy may be full. Faith is easy when you have joy. But if your joy does not climax, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your faith will suffer. Do you know why I enjoy doing miracles? Many times the Lord will tell me, lift this one off the wheelchair. But there are times he won't tell me anything. But I just know by my excitement is going to help somebody. Not even because he told me, because there are people that I look at and the Lord will say, not yet. But there are people the Lord will say, not yet, but I feel so sorry for them. And I plead on their behalf and God allows me to pull them out. Yes. But one thing that never dies is my excitement consistently to see it all the time. I don't know if you guys remember this. Remember that young girl that had like some weird autoimmune disease that she ended up on the wheelchair for a long time. She, her legs became frail and small. And her mother is the one who cried, Prophet, please, my daughter, my daughter, they don't know what is going on. We've tried everything. They can't. It's just not making sense. And the young girl was on the wheelchair. God didn't tell me to raise her up. I asked him for mercy for her. And when I looked at her and I said, I saw now the spirit that was holding her. And I told him to leave her. What happened? This, she jumped out of the wheelchair. She ran. She had not walked for months. I don't know how many times that has happened. But my thing is not, I am waiting to see if God is going to do it. How can you anoint me for somebody to remain in the same situation? That will be a contradiction of what you have given me. Ah, uh, you didn't hear what I'm telling you. So God wants our joy to be full because if our joy is full, then we can manifest his glories even more. So if you are more than a conqueror, why are you praying from a place of defeat? That, that is why God cannot answer you. You are out of line. Because God is dealing with you from one place and you are dealing with God from another place. Let me, let me tell you what sin really is to God. Stealing is not sin. Killing is not sin. That is not really, those are symptoms of sin. Have you noticed the Bible never speaks of sin in plural? 
it always speaks of it in singular, in singular form. Through one man, sin entered into the world, but the symptoms of sin are stealing, killing, doing all these things. That is why Jesus summarizes the law to two things. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because the absence of love is not hate. It is fear. And fear is not of God. And sin comes from fear. Yes. That is why the love of God casts out fear. It doesn't cast out sin. <laughs> cast out fear. Fear leaves you. Sin goes. Because sin, fear, makes you look for fig leaves to cover yourself. You see, when you have children and you have raised them in love, if they are wrong, they are comfortable telling you they are wrong. They don't have to hide anything. <laughs> uh, mom and dad, I did this. I know it's wrong, but I don't know why I was weak to do it. Then you can restore them easily. There is no room for sin to happen because sin must be hidden. If it is hidden, it is sin. If it is in the open, it's no longer sin. I don't know if this is making sense to you. When God came to Adam and Eve, they went and hid themselves. How do you hide yourself from God? It means you have become God. You are now looking for your own solutions. That is the biggest sin. To not need God is our sin. That is why you find every sin is committed when you're hiding from God. <laughs> and why do you hide from God? Because of fear. <laughs> Hello? So whenever we are filled with fear, fear starts to make you self-righteous because now you have to self-justify. You start doing things of your own strength to paint yourself at a certain place or a certain way. You begin to dress yourself so that you can stand before God comfortably. But the problem is, Whenever you stand before God, it's like standing before a mirror. If you don't look like him, you cannot draw from him because the deep call it unto the deep. So many of us have a self-distorted image, but we want to interact with God from that distorted image. It's not going to work. That is why when you are even have, even when you have failed in the sight of God, God does not look at you as a failure because God is looking at you from the image of being established in him. But if you look at yourself through the eyes of what you did, that is a fragment of a, of a nanosecond in the spirit. You have made it to be the, 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 the pillar of who you are. But in the grand scheme of things, when God observes eternity, what your mistake is, is not even a microsecond. So if you hold on to that, then you have distorted the bigger picture. And how then will God interact with you? God does not forget what we have done. Because we already did it. And the reason why God can love us, you have to remember, love is only produced when there is error. You cannot love without error. If you love those who are good, then there is no reward in it because love is not displayed because you have an affection of somebody. Love is only produced when there is error. Throughout scripture, God is saying, Jacob, I love, Esau, I hate. <laughs> How can, Jacob means a planter. God is saying, I love the, crim the criminal. 
Esau was supposed to be the perfect child, firstborn. But God is saying, I love the one they don't like, the one that is tricky, the one that is mischievous. That is the one I love. God has always loved those who people have rejected. According to the standard of men, they are failures. That's what God wants. So if you look at John 1, it says this, it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Not because we were good, it was not a gift. Or or let me say it like this, it was a gift, but it was not a reward. (laughs) Many times we give gifts because we miss people, or it's a reward of some sort, or an affection. No, God gave Jesus because we are bad. That is the only time that God says, I love the whole world. Before that, he said, I love Israel. I have accepted him. (laughs) You other guys, not yet. (laughs) He couldn't declare his love for the world. Because he had not put any act forward that he says that he loves the world. But is that technically true? No, because if you read Revelation, what does it tell you? And to the lamb who was crucified before the foundations of the earth. Notice God cannot produce something that was not already produced before everything began. So the love of God for you and me was established before even the world fell. Because if God has to create a new formula to love us, then he is not God. If God has to wait for me to be good, then he is not God. So even in my approach of God, even in your approach of God, you have to know that I am already naked before him. There's nothing he doesn't know. So the Lord Jesus comes and says it like this. He says, don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Your father knows you need these things. So why do we pray for daily bread? Why do we pray for provision? It means we have not entered into the faith where we know. No, this is the truth. We have not entered in the place whereby we have rested. You look and you say, "Ah, Father, you know. Many of you don't feel secure until you sit there. Rabba Shata. Kalama Soto. Now God. (laughs) You are able. Unless you do that, you don't believe the prayer will be answered. Yet the highest form of faith is when you rest. Because you know. Just because I pray for 10 hours, it won't make God answer something faster. God answers because he has decided. If I pray for 10 hours, it's not to compel God, it's to change me. Fasting doesn't change God, it changes us. Prayer doesn't change God or speed up God. It changes us. It positions us to receive from him. God is already speaking. But if I fast and humble my soul, calibrate myself, then I will hear God. So people have made it that if you want to hear God fast. No. Cain kills his brother and he hears God. You, you have never killed anyone and you're struggling to hear God. It means there is a consciousness in you that is stopping you from hearing God. Cain just killed his brother and threw his body somewhere. And God comes and says, Cain, where is your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Look at even his interaction with God. Disrespectful. (laughs) But God is still talking. Cain, your brother's blood is crying for me from the ground. What have you done? Ah, Lord, I'm sorry. Did I not tell you if you don't give the right way, sin is seeking your heart to distort you? He's still having a conversation with God. The Pharaoh of Egypt in the time of Moses, uh, in the time of, of Joseph, is a pagan. But God tells him what is going to happen to his nation. You, you are filled with the Holy Ghost. You can't even remember a dream. 
You're asking God for direction. You can't even see even a flash. You realize quickly that it's not God, it's us. The Pharaoh in the time of Abraham. Abraham goes down to Egypt and says, Hey, Sarah, you are my sister. The king takes his sister, doesn't touch her, but he's starting to now put things in motion, sending Abraham crazy gifts to win sister over. <laughs> Then at night he goes to sleep. The Lord comes to him and says, you are a dead man. The guy is shocked. But notice the interaction. God didn't say, I am God and I've come for your life. He says, you are a dead man. And he says, Lord, what have I done? He said, return this man's wife to him. He is a prophet. Notice God is informing him of things Abraham did not tell him about himself. He is a prophet. He said, Lord, the guy lied to me. He didn't tell me that this was, he told me that this is his sister. He didn't tell me that he's his wife. And you know I did not touch her. What did the Lord say? I know you did not touch her because I kept you from touching her. Now return his wife to himself and carry a fat seed so that he can pray for you so I don't strike you. God, God is... <laughs> Remember, Abraham needed money because there is a drought. <laughs> so God is making the king give him money <laughs> so that God doesn't strike him but so that he can answer Abraham's prayer. So in the morning he comes to Abraham and says, my guy, why have you done this evil to us? Have I not been good to you that you wanted to destroy me? And remember the Pharaoh even says, Lord, you know I didn't touch her. Notice the conversation. Is that conversation of a man that has never met God? It means it was not the first time God spoke to him. Notice God is even going beyond his traditions. Because God had a purpose for him to deal with Abraham some way, somehow. You are predestinated. You have no information from God. Balaam a wizard. <laughs> You've never even done witchcraft in your life. Balaam a wizard is sent to curse Israel. He's cursing Israel, but instead of cursing them, the words coming out of him is blessing them. He said, I can't curse those whom God have, has blessed. You, you've never been a witch in your life, but you can't even speak the blessing of God over you. You don't know God's blessing over you. A wizard who is trying to destroy you can hear God to know what God has blessed you with. Uh, you're not hearing me, children of God. Balaam is trying to curse, but he's saying you are above and not below. <laughs> no weapon formed against you shall come to pass or shall prosper. I see you increasing. I see healing. I see... Then the guy who hired him is like, yo, my guy, I hired you to curse them. He said, I cannot curse them. God is speaking differently, but this guy is a wizard. How is he hearing God? You have made hearing God a Holy Ghost thing, yet it's not. It's a sonship thing. It's a sonship thing. I don't start speaking or instructing my child because they obey me. I instruct them because they don't obey me. They need more instruction. In the church today, we want God to speak because we have become good. Now that I'm obedient, now God will speak to me. Yet God needs to be your father. To nurture you into obedience. Not you becoming obedient by yourself. It doesn't work like that. I have never seen a child becoming structured by themselves. So our mindset, remember, as a man thinketh so easy. So the way you think is determining how God is going to work. Hallelujah. 
הלו. הלו, הלו. One of the greatest things that you can ever do for your spiritual life is ask questions. Before the caller will answer, while they are still speaking, I will hear. So do I need to really open my heart or I need to rest? God will give me my heart's desire. He did not say what I will say with my mouth. What is in my heart? Do you believe God knows your, your, your list that is in your heart? So all these things are maturities in dealing or it's a state of maturity in God. We have made maturity about how long you've been a Christian, how long you can pray, but not the attitude of Christ the Lord himself. When we say in Jesus' name, the word there is anoma. Anoma doesn't mean in the name. It means in the manner which in the character of. When the Lord Jesus wanted to feed the multitude, he did not start praying the prayer of multiplication. All he did is he gave thanks. Because he knew that his father brought these 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, and it is his duty to feed them. He lifted what he has. He says, Father, I thank you, you who gives us uh, food and this and this. He put it down, broke it in pieces. He said, feed people. They did not see the bread multiply, like we see in the movies where he lifts it up. When he puts it down, it has multiplied. It wasn't like that. He literally broke them into pieces and then said, feed the people. Every time they put their hand in the basket, pulled out a loaf of bread, the same bread was back in the basket again. It just never ended. And Jesus didn't say, let me try one to see if it worked. He gave thanks and gave it. When you know and when you mature to the state that God wants you to be in, God will no longer operate with you with time. He will no longer wait for you to mature according to time. He will give it to you before even you deserve it according to time. Classic example. Jesus is invited to a wedding with his disciples. <laughs> Jesus is at the wedding minding his own business, but we know for sure that Jesus is invited because his mother is affiliated. How do we know his mother is affiliated? How did she know there was no more wine? It means she knew what was happening in the kitchen. How do we know? Because the guests were already drunk. And the master of the ceremony attests to this. Jesus' mother comes. And says, there is no wine. <laughs> she didn't say, my son, is there any way you can make wine? <laughs> it was not a suggestion. <laughs> the mother of Jesus said unto him, John 2, 3. They have no more wine. They have no more. She didn't say, my son... I know you are God and I know the anointing upon your life and I know anything you want from God, he will give it to you. <coughs> Ask him for wine. He came, she came and said, they have no wine. Jesus' response is very strange. He says, woman. In Prophet Lovi revised version. <laughs> What do you want from me? <laughs> Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? What do I have to do with your wine? Then he goes on to say, My hour has not come. You have to understand what the mother of Jesus asked him to do. Jesus was going to share the wine on his ascension. To him it was like his mother asked him to die. Because Jesus is waiting for his own wedding. 
and his covenant with his people will be done by the same cup. Now his mother is tempting him saying, remember Jesus already started preaching. But for him, this was more of an intimate spiritual thing that he was like, what are you asking me to do? My hour has not come. What was his hour? This is my cup given to you. Drink this in my remembrance. He's saying, woman, you are killing me before my time. My hour to do this wine thing has not come. But look at what his mother does. His mother didn't say, okay, I understand. Don't do it. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. She walks away. His mother saith unto the servants, hey, Mary. Mary was gangster. <laughs> she left him while he's saying, woman, my time hasn't come. She walked away. Went to the servants and said, whatsoever he said unto you, do it. And walked away. She didn't call, come to check if he did it. Basically, figure it out. If it's not your hour, then figure it out. <laughs> Jesus immediately says, go get... Notice his mother even knew what he would do. Go and take this. Go and fill it like this. And go and give it to the master of the ceremony. He drinks, he says, guys, 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 what is wrong with you people? You usually bring the best wine, and when people are drunk, then you bring the bad ones, so they can't tell. Now, you guys are doing it opposite. You're bringing the best wine when nobody will recognize that the best wine is there. Many of you are still operating with old wine. So you have not yet enjoyed the new wine that comes with a different set of covenants and structure that draws you closer to God, no farther from him. You are still drunk with what used to be. You are still caught up with the old rules. And remember, a drunk person cannot be instructed. You sinned, you're going to hell. God doesn't listen to sinners. How did you get born again? You called on him from your sin and he still heard you to give you salvation. Here is somebody telling you, you messed up, God will not listen to you. Then how did he hear me when I was in the world? When I called on to him. You see, we don't think about those things. So it's easy for Satan to give you condemnation. Because he knows that you don't even understand how you got saved. You are lost in the world. One day you realize, you say, Father, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, save me. And you come out and say, I am born again, filled with the Holy Ghost. But you are a sinner. How did he answer a sinner? So is sin really the hindrance? No. It is your decision to be with him. If you make it about your actions, then you have made sin greater than the cross. The weight of the cross to the Lord Jesus was not sin. Because Jesus had become sin, not the cross. The cross was his liberation, was his freedom. The weight of the cross was heavier than Jesus because salvation holds more weight than sin. Uh, you didn't hear what I'm telling you. That Jesus needed help to carry the solution. He needed another African Simon to come and help him to carry it. But we make sin heavier than the cross, yet the cross is heavier. Notice this, the cross is so durable, is so strong that it could lift sin up and dismantle it for good. That is why in our churches we have the cross. The cross is not a symbol of death to us. It is a symbol of victory. 
We celebrate the cross and the sacrifice that was upon it. Meaning the cross is the perfect altar to offer something to God. But we want to carry the cross and our and ourselves. <laughs> Yet the cross is supposed to carry us. And if we have been crucified with Jesus, when the Bible says carry your cross, it is not talking about your personal cross. You don't have a cross. There is only one that carried the cross. It is the Lord Jesus. So when the Bible tells you carry your cross daily, it is not talking about the cross that you have been, you are not going to be crucified. Jesus is the one that is crucified, right? The Bible says we are crucified with Christ. It doesn't say we will be crucified by ourselves. So when the Bible is telling you carry your cross daily, what is it asking you to carry? Carry the salvation you are given by Christ by going one time on the cross. But we are trying to formulate all these other things to save us, yet that is not what God is saying. We can carry the cross now because we are aligned with salvation. So it is a symbol of consistent victory. It is not longer a, a symbol of condemnation because I have already died. I'm on the other side of the cross. That is why I always say this. One time I said this and the internet erupted. <laughs> ah, they went crazy. I said, Jesus didn't die for me. They say, how can he say that? It's true. If you are born again, Jesus didn't die for you. He died for the old you. This new you has nothing to do with the cross. It's the product of it. Behold, old things have passed away. You are a new creation, but you're still saying he died for you. He died for the old man. The old man is dead, doesn't live anymore. So if your mind is still looking at the cross as a place of condemnation, you cannot rise up with God. You are a product of the cross. You are not the cause of it. We cannot say, Father, I am a sinner. <laughs> God is looking at you and saying, where? You no longer sin, you only make mistakes because you are a child. If you are a child, then you are bound to make mistakes. To be a sinner is not working with God at all. Because the Bible says he that has received Christ cannot sin. Have you received Jesus? Yes. But you believe you can sin. Yet a person who is dead is no longer under the law cannot sin. <laughs> the problem is you are a living dead. <laughs> you are living sacrifice. So your, 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 <laughs> your carnal mind is confused. <laughs> You still see yourself like what used to be, but it is another person dwelling in you. And the person that counts is the one that is dwelling in you, not the body that has already died. Stop bringing up old things to God. Stop bringing up old things to God. You are derailing yourself. Stop bringing up your failures that happened in 1956 before God consistently. You're you are, you are miscommunicating with God because he doesn't understand what you're talking about. You're a new creation. I have realized it's much more difficult for people to believe they are a new creation. Yet it is freedom. Paul says it this way. He says, the good I want to do, I don't do it. And the bad that I do not want to do, I do. Therefore, if I sin, it's no longer I who sins. <laughs> it is sin that dwells in my body that is already condemned. Look at how he separated himself from his body. You still make you and your body one thing. <laughs> Therefore, if I sin, it is no longer I who sins. <laughs> Paul, 
Uncle Paul was different. It is no longer I. I'm not the one doing it. It is the broken system of this body. It is reacting because I don't want to do it. But the body is doing it anyway. So it's not me. It wasn't me. (laughs) Satan comes and tells you, I saw you doing this. You say, it wasn't me. (laughs) But you did this. It wasn't me. (laughs) I saw you in this place. Ah, it wasn't me. And God will second that and say, yeah, it wasn't you. Disconnect from God is when you are enjoying the bad. But when your spirit is rejecting it, but your, spirit, your, your flesh is still weak, you are still on track. Because you don't want that, and eventually God will give you the strength to overcome that as you remain in his presence. Amen. Let me leave you with this. Let me leave you with this. This is a very beautiful scripture. This is a very interesting verse. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Ephesians 1 and 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Okay, (laughs) read that again. (laughs) According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So he chose you from the before the foundations of the earth. And how did he choose you? That we should be holy. That we should be holy. Right? Mm -hmm. So why do you think holiness has to do with sin? Yet you already found it to be holy. That's good. Nobody is preaching holiness. Wait a minute. We say God is holy, right? Holy, holy God Almighty. Has God ever sinned? So if God is associated with holiness and he has never sinned, it means holiness has nothing to do with sin. Think, of, think about that for a second. God has never sinned, but we say holy God. The Bible says God is not evil. He is not tempted by evil. He is God. If he has to be holy, it means he's abiding by a certain law. And if he's abiding by a law, then he has a God. That's really good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to repeat that one more time. If God is holy because he has never sinned, then it means that God is led by a law that if he breaks, he will no longer be holy. That means he has a God that determines what God will be. You did this, you're no longer holy. Now people use this scripture. Be holy, for I am holy. They say, be like God. You need to walk in holiness. It's it's the lack of education. If we were founded to be holy, and God is your father, he's telling you that the nature of holiness, you already have it too. It is how he is. Be holy, For I am holy. If you proceed from him. Now, I have never seen a crocodile give birth to a lion. (laughs) So if God is saying be holy, he's not saying keep my law to be holy. (laughs) He's commanding you. Can you be? Just like he said, light be. Be holy. For I am holy. He's calling you to something he has bestowed on you. It has nothing to do with works. Let me prove it to you further. Holy angels. But you will judge angels. It means the angels have imperfections. (laughs) 
hello. hello. You, you, you will judge angels. How will I judge people who have never made a mistake or they make mistakes? Let's go a little further. And the God of the holy prophets, every prophet sinned. Why is God calling them holy? Sin was fixed by righteousness. It was not fixed by holiness. Nobody can become holy. The way to holiness is not by keeping the law. The way to holiness is receiving Jesus. Holiness cannot come through the law. Holiness doesn't come because you have done certain things. No. When Moses went up the mountain, what did the Lord tell him? Take off thy shoes from off thy feet because the ground you are standing on is holy. So when God commanded him to remove his shoes, to stand on holy ground, what does the Bible say about feet? Wherever the soles of your feet shall be set, you shall what? You shall possess. So if God is telling him, remove your shoes so that your feet can touch this place. What was God making him? Teaching. You're teaching. That's great. You, you didn't get it. God was making him something. Holiness has nothing to do with what you do. It is a grace bestowed upon us. You are a royal priesthood. A holy nation. You are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. A royal priesthood. We didn't choose. When did you get ordained to be a priest? God is saying you are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. Wait, what did I do to become a royal priesthood? He doesn't tell you. He said you are. <laughs> you didn't pray. No, you already are. So we need to understand God's memory because God's memory is not inactive. It is active based on what he has already predestinated and what he has ordained. Right. To live pure is not holiness. But because of holiness, you will live pure. Right. Notice what the first says. Read this again. Look at this. The same Ephesians. Mm -hmm. Read it. Uh -huh. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Meaning you can be holy and have a blame. God is not just saying being ho be holy, saying but be holy without a blame. Meaning you can have a blame on you and you are holy. <laughs> yes. Because whether you have blame or not, you are still holy. But God wants you to be holy without what? That's good. Change your picture of God. And you will go much farther with God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, a simple homework to do is meditate on this. And whenever you meditate, learn to, uh, to make the meditation personal. An example, uh, let, me, let me help you by fixing this, right? Understanding this. Your, your mind cannot tell the difference between an event mm -hmm. that is going to happen and an event that has happened. Your, your, your mind can't tell the difference. Because the organ of the soul, or the soul as an organ, it validates reality. It validates reality, meaning that, an example, if somebody shakes your hand, or let me go even further, if somebody gives you a hug, and the hug wasn't genuine, what do you say? I didn't feel it. Yet the person was holding you. But what do you say? I did not feel it, meaning that your soul did not get a, a, what is the word I'm looking for? Your, your soul did not validate it because it did not compute with it. 
Even though the physical action was there, even though a hug happened, your soul was not hugged. It cannot validate it as reality. You consider it fake. That wasn't a real hug. (laughs) Are you getting it now? So your soul validates reality. If somebody tells you, I love you, and there are people who look at you and say, I love you, you feel it, you say, wow, this person really loves me. Why? Because there was an emotional content that manifested, that moved your own soul, right? Let me make it a little extreme. Those who struggle with pornography, usually, and this is a real study, you can go and look it up, and this is one of the reasons you should pray for deliverance from this, right? Those who struggle with pornography is that you have been meditating so much because meditation is something that you do over and over again until it becomes reality to you. Whenever a person is engaging in masturbation, they are not thinking that they are watching something. The only moment your body becomes truly aroused to the point of orgasm or whatever it is, is because now you believe you're engaging with them. Your soul is engaged with what you're doing, that your body reacts as if you are with them. Your body forgets that you are doing this to yourself because the soul says we are engaging with this person. Now, the moment now you want to escape that and be intimate with your husband or your wife, what happens is you are no longer aroused because your soul has been exposed to a different kind of stimulation. That physical stimulation is no longer stimulating you. Why? Because your soul already believed you did all these unrealistic things, but your soul is real. So now when you engage with a real person who would never do the acting that these people are acting and pretending, you feel unsatisfied and lust sets in. Notice what is making you not be able to engage with a person is not that you don't have somebody physically. It is that your soul (laughs) has validated another reality that this reality seems false. Uh, are, you, are you hearing me? Imagine TV has become more real than a human being. In satisfying you. In your marriage bed that cannot be defiled. Something else is satisfying you more. And that's when people start having erectile dysfunction things because the brain can no longer be stimulated because blood no longer rushes to your mind unless it is extreme. The more you engage, the more extreme you will watch. And then it gets to a point where you can't just watch one thing. You have to watch multiple things to stimulate you. This is a real study. I have to counsel people so I have to know these things. You have to watch multiple things back to back to back for it to stimulate you. But how many people are you going to lay with at the same time for you to be stimulated? But your soul knows this to be real. So now you have a problem. Because you have personalized whatever you are watching. Imagine if you do the reverse with scripture. You will see angels, you will even touch them. You start bumping into them in your kitchen. You'll be like, I thought it was a vision. No, it's real. I'm teaching you the art of meditation in simplicity. Many of you have never done this simple exercise where you sit down and you say, you create the worst scenario in your mind because your soul can't tell the difference. You visualize this. You say, um, if I lost everything like Job, lose my house, ooh, wow, that would be painful. Lose my children, lose my husband or my wife. How would that world look like? And you see it. 
And then you ask yourself, will Jesus still be Lord? Ah, if I have Jesus, I have everything. If that can become reality to you, the devil will never mess with you again because to the devil you would have already lost everything and Jesus matters the most to you. He will not dare to touch anything. It will be a waste of time. If anything, it will make you stronger in prayer. Because to your soul, you have already engaged with it. Because Satan does not tempt your spirit. He tempts your soul. Uh, <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? That's how Jesus overcame the cross. He kept talking about it. The son of man, this was going to happen. He already saw it. With his own soul. Not just what his father told him. He visualized it. It became a reality somewhere you will go and he did not shy from it. The issue is you don't do such things to prepare yourself. If cancer hit me today, and many of you think that if I think like that, it means I'm attracting sickness. That's a lie. Don't be so weak. These are realities of life. It can happen. Then what? If I got sick today with an incurable disease, is the Lord Jesus still Lord? Yes. Is the Lord Jesus still Lord? What if I die? Then I'm with him. If I live, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I don't care what happens to me. Immediately you become off Satan's limits because you live in the reality that if I lose my life, I have picked it up. And if I pick up my life, I will die. So I'd rather be with God. How you, you know you cannot beat somebody who has nothing to lose. That is meditation. That is authentic meditation. So when you start to sit and now see yourself, mm, okay, before I was in this world, he, knew, he knows everything about me. Not he will know, he knows, Okay. So what if I do this? Will this change God's mind? Mm. Now nah, I can't change him. Even what I did last week, ah, he already... Now you are in a place of grace and not the place of sin anymore because you have seen God's love and God's love is what delivers you. You see, when the church preaches sin, they think they are preaching a solution, but they are not. Only grace saves you from sin. Only grace. Whatever you meditate on, you become. So if you keep telling people, you sinners, notice you haven't called them, you righteous men. <laughs> you children of the most high God. Because the more somebody says something, hears something, and you meditate it, you become it. But if you always think the other way, the other way, the other, the, what, what, uh, you liars. You know, when you have raised children, you know this. Some of you are parents and some of you are not, but I'll tell you this. You don't fix your children by telling them, you liar. You tell them, why did you lie? Because if I call them a liar, what I'm saying is that is their nature. Their nature is not that. I always tell Andrew this. I tell Andrew, when he makes a mistake, Andrew, you are better than this. This is who you are. I start pointing it one by one by one. Why would you do this and this is not you? Notice I have separated him from his mistake and I've made the mistake smaller than him. Yeah. Then it's easy to let go of that. But if I make the mistake bigger than him and I tell him this is who you are, now I have assigned him. That's right. That's good. That is why God doesn't look at you and say, you sinner. He calls you my beloved, my child. He who did not spare his own son. Thank you, Lord. How much more will he do for you? God is not condemning anyone. A prostitute say, they say, uh, Jesus says, where is your accusers? She says, I have none. Jesus says, I don't accuse you either. Go and see no more. Notice how light of the mistake Jesus made it. The, the church today, hey. You make one mistake. We knew it. Why didn't you pray for me if you knew it? <laughs> right. 
God gave me a dream and you didn't pray about it. So it's your fault I fail. Because the last time I checked when God gives you a vision is to save. God reveals to redeem. He doesn't reveal for you to condemn. Jesus told Peter, Peter, you will betray me. But I've prayed for you to overcome. He didn't just tell him, you traitor. Says Peter, tonight you will betray me. Before the, uh, uh, the, the chicken goes, kukuruku. <laughs> you would have already betrayed me three times. He didn't say you are a traitor. Even Judas was a traitor. Jesus told him, Judas, you betrayed the son of man with a kiss. He didn't call him a traitor. And a lot of you say Judas is in hell. Judas is not in hell. It was his purpose. If he knew why he was born, he would have never accepted. Jesus said that. If he knew why he was born, meaning he was destined to do what he did. It's in your scriptures. And if Jesus led the captives out of hell, guess who also went to hell when Jesus died? Judas, then he came out. <laughs> Even though the Bible goes as far as to say, and he appeared unto the twelve when he rose again. <laughs> I thought one of them had died. <laughs> they had not selected Matthias yet. And many of, of the graves were open and many of the patriarchs of old were seen in the city. It's in your scriptures. Everyone looks at Judas like Satan. Yet without Judas, we have no salvation. Because you have to, you see, Judas and Jesus are relatives. Because they both come from the same place. So in order for a sacrifice to be given, your own people have to give you up to the priests. So Judas represented... <laughs> 30 pieces of silver was to buy the 30 years of purity. Jesus preserved his life. Blameless until he was released. All that was strategic. God set that up. You look at somebody, you say, you Judas. You just said he's assigned to promote you. He's not really your enemy. He's working for you. God doesn't waste anything. <laughs> Shake your neighbor and say, God doesn't, God doesn't waste anything. I can't hear you. God waste Everything we have magnified, if you know scripture, you realize it's a small thing. Just like the hell thing, I was laughing at some people saying, oh, hell is, so many people are in hell. Yeah, it is true. One soul in hell is too many. But there are way more people in heaven than hell could ever have. Way more. But if you listen to preachers, they will make you believe that hell is packed. That's not true. It's just not true. There's no way. If you know scripture, you know that is impossible. Jesus comes and he liberates people from hell. Those who are disobedient from the day of Noah to his time. That is over 2,000 years worth. 3,000? About 3,000 years of souls in hell. He took them all out. And then the dispensation we go into is the dispensation of grace and the gospel. So from the beginning of time until the time of Jesus, which is only 2,000 and some change years ago, everybody that was in hell from the beginning was taken out. Yeah. Now in this dispensation, yes, there are people going to hell. And remember, one soul in hell is too many. Right? But now we have more salvation in play than they did in their time. 
So can you really compare the numbers of people in heaven and hell? No. It's impossible. Because if you say hell has more people than God lost, and God has never lost. And the Bible goes as far as to say, there are vessels of honor and there are vessels of dishonor. And there are vessels of destruction. The people in the pit right now, they were also destined. We did not choose salvation, he chose us. So we are saved because of grace, not because we are good. Amen. Amen. Yeah, look at your clapping. That's why you think you are responsible for your salvation. We are not. When you see this thing from God's perspective, you realize, man, we are just flies on the wall. We're just going with a program. <laughs> God is good. So remember, don't pray from a place of defeat. You already won. You already won. This is why prayer and thanksgiving goes a long way. Then venting and complaining. God doesn't mind it, but it can't be too much. Because now that's unbelief. And when you praise God, don't pretend praise. <laughs> Father, I just want to praise you right now. Why? <laughs> praise is a prophetic act because something has happened. So if I praise God, it's because I've meditated and I've actually seen the victory of God. So I am celebrating because I know what I was crying about yesterday. God has already taken care of it. And I'm just waiting for me to see it. So while I'm waiting to see it, my excitement is spilling over. That's what true praise is. True praise is not a chore. If it's a chore, you're not praising. Because if praise arises in you, you can't stop it. When you meet the people you look up to, your excitement cannot be contained. That's how you should be when you know your miracle is coming. But if you have to fake praise, fake worship, no wonder we are delayed. Let's, let's lift our hands to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this time of simple discussion but with so much weight of your truth that we may know you as you are and as you desire for us to know you. Father, give us the grace to consistently understand and walk in light of our salvation. Father, you have done beyond what we will ever understand. So Father, we thank you for all that in advance. Father, we pray for grace and mercy that we will remain on this path that glorifies you, on this path that magnifies you, on this path that consistently, Father, reveals who you are. Father, our mistakes and our shortcomings are not a disqualification. They are actually the reason that we are qualified. So, Father, we thank you even for weaknesses because your power then can rest upon us. Father, we don't want to run from weaknesses. We want to run to you because it's all about you. It's not about the enemy. It's not about the lack. It's not about the difficulty. It's about you. We want to be with you. So, Father, help us to be with you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. God bless you all. And uh, I pray this discussion is a blessing to you. And I will see you tomorrow. Shalom. Bless.